Let's go ahead and start by opening with a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day, and, and Lord, just help us as we come to study your word. Help us to set aside in our mind all the, the thoughts and the, the, the trials and the struggles that we're going through, Lord, and just help us to focus purely on your word and what you would have us to learn from it, Lord, to instruct us and to teach us. So, Lord, just help us to have open hearts and minds now and help us to be fed by your word. And may all of it just bring you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Well, once again, I have the privilege to uh, come before you guys this morning. And um, if you've been coming for a while, you know that as I've had the chance to to speak. I've been <clears throat> working through what, I've, what I have entitled as the arm, armaments of the believer. And really, the, this has been focused all around the things that God has given to us to equip us, to equip us while we're in this world, to strengthen us, to help us as we walk through the challenges of this life. Because as believers, we, we oftentimes on this earth face challenges, don't we? We face all sorts of challenges. We face all sorts of trials, many trials. They come in different shapes and different sizes and different forms. Um, they can be troubles at work. Troubles with our finances. They can be troubles with our health. They can be trials with loved ones. They can be trials with family. And if we're being honest, the list can go on and on and on and on. We face all sorts of trials and struggles as believers. Sometimes they're minor. Sometimes they're manger. Sometimes they seem to just keep coming and coming and coming, and sometimes it just seems like they'll never, ever stop. And a lot of times, if we aren't careful, if we aren't careful, even as believers, we can begin to take our eyes off of Christ we begin to make the same mistake that Peter made when he stepped out onto the water and he began to, instead of staying focused on Christ, he began to stare at the storm. And what happened? He began to sink. And oftentimes as believers, we do the same thing in the midst of our trials. We take our eyes off of Christ and we begin to focus on the trials that are around us and it becomes overwhelming. Those trials become overwhelming when we begin to focus on them. And it can quickly begin to feel like more than we are able to bear. And it is at those times that we can quickly become discouraged and disheartened. And instead of being spiritually strong, we become weak and cowardice we begin to feel like God has left us all alone here on this earth to just deal with these things on our own. We feel abandoned and helpless, and we see no way out of the trials that we're facing. That's how we feel. When we begin to focus on those things, that's how we feel. But that is just our feelings. And our feelings are oftentimes wrong. God has not abandoned us. He has not left us here all alone. He has given us everything we need to face each and every trial and battle in this life. He has equipped us with everything we need to not only survive through the trials, but to thrive in the midst of them. 
As Paul put it to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, He, that is God, has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That isn't just some blessings he's, blessings he's given us. He has given us every spiritual blessing. In other words, he has equipped us. He has armed us so that we can be triumphant in the face of these battles, in the face of these trials. And so, we have been looking at what exactly he has given us to battle these trials with. And there's really four main things he's given us that are absolutely vital in the walk of any believer. Absolutely vital. First of all, it's the Holy Spirit. Second of all, it's the Word of God himself the Bible. Third of all, it's prayer. And then last, but definitely not least, it is the gathering together of the body. It's the church. So the first time I taught through this, we focused on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. God's Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit is an amazing gift of God. This gift that he would send his spirit, the third person of the Godhead, to come and to dwell inside of us, to guide us, and to continuously point us to none other than Christ himself. And then the last time I taught, we focused on God's word. On God's word, which is, at, which is absolutely the very breath of God himself written down onto paper to guide us in every aspect of life and to teach us and to equip us. God's word is given to us to make us complete and to teach us of the very nature of God himself. God has miraculously worked to preserve and to keep his word from the very beginning all the way up to today in order that all believers might be strengthened by it. God's word is absolutely a gift it is a gift that God himself has kept and preserved for us. So today I want to focus on the third gift that God has given to us. And just like the first two that we've already looked at, this gift is given to strengthen us to build us up, to encourage us, and to always keep us heavenly focused, to keep our eyes focused squarely on God. And that is the gift of prayer. It is the gift of prayer. And that is the very first thing I want you to understand is that prayer is a gift given by God to the believers. Prayer, prayer is a gift. Can any, just anyone pray to God? Spiritually speaking, the answer is no. Scripture is abundantly clear that not just anyone can pray to God. And these verses might come as a shock to you if you've never heard this, but just listen to this. Listen to these verses. 1 Peter 3.12 For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ear attend to their prayer, 
But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Isaiah 1.15 So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eye from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Proverbs 28, 9, and to me, this one is the most striking. He, he who turns his ear from listening to the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Do you guys know what the word abomination means? An abomination is something that causes total disgust and hatred. These verses might come as something as a shock to the world because in a, in a world where they're just told all the time that God just loves them regardless of their sins or what they do, Scripture is absolutely clear here that the prayers of the wicked are nothing more than an abomination to him. Their prayers are, are a source of total disgust to God. It's much like Isaiah when God in, it's much like in Isaiah when God says that even the best deeds of man are mo- nothing more than what filthy rags. The best deeds of man are nothing more than filthy rags. They are worthless. They're garbage. So the word of God is clear. God does not hear the prayers of the wicked. Which, by the way, was all of us before we came to know the Lord. Everywhere you look, you constantly see unbelievers flippantly praying to God, just like he's the man upstairs just waiting to grant their every request. But again, God does not hear them. He does not listen to those prayers. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And why is that? It's because of sin. It's because of sin. Every single man and woman on this earth is nothing more than a wretched sinner. And that sin separates us from God. And that separation is a total and complete Separation. God is a holy God. God is a righteous God. And God will not allow sin to dwell in his presence. And that includes even in the form of a prayer offered by a sin filled person. And I know that's striking, but. It's just to show you that prayer, prayer is not given to all. Even though they may try to imitate it, God does not listen to them. So if God does not hear the prayers of the wicked, whose prayers does he hear? Whose prayers does he hear? Proverbs 15, 29 The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. He hears the prayer of the righteous. See, not only do I want you to understand that prayer is a gift given to the believers by God, but it is a gift 
given to the believers that is purchased for us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Because again, Proverbs 15, 29, he hears the prayers of the righteous. Who here is righteous in and of themselves? Not one of us. Not one of us. Only by being united with Christ in his saving work upon the cross in which he took our sins upon himself and bore the full weight of the punishment for us. Only by being united with Christ in his shed blood on the cross have our, not only have our sins been dealt with by Christ, but in return we have been given his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So through Christ and only through Christ we have been made righteous in the eyes of God. And so likewise, it is only through Christ that our prayers are heard. Because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, he not, he not only has dealt with our sins and given us his righteousness, but he has given us direct access to God the Father. Remember, our sins separated us from God totally and completely. We could not approach God in any way, shape, or form because of our sin. But guess what? Because of Christ's sacrifice, we now have direct access to God in our prayers. Christ entered through the veil for us. And by his perfect sacrifice, literally tore the veil that separated us from the Father in two, from top to bottom. That veil stood as a symbol of the separation there was between God and, and man. It protected the Holy of Holies from all of the rest of sin-filled man. No man could enter through that veil in and of themselves. Christ tore it in two from top to bottom. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, that is to say, he entered through the veil. And then it says, having obtained eternal redemption. Christ entered by his own perfect shed blood. And he atoned for our sins. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. And that gained us access to God the Father. The veil is no longer needed, which is why, to me, it is just so recorded, so amazing what was recorded by Matthew at the moment of Jesus' death upon the cross. Matthew 27, verses 50 through 51. This is what was recorded at the exact moment Jesus died. It says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The veil was torn in two. I can't overstate how huge of a deal that was. Again, that veil stood for hundreds of years as a vivid sign to the people of the separation there was between God and man. Man could not approach God. But now the veil had been torn by the shed 
blood of Christ, making it clear that now if you are united with Christ, there is no longer any separation between you and God. That you have direct access to God through Christ Jesus. To put it again in the, wor- in the words of the author of Hebrews, we now have an anchor that rests within the veil. Hebrews 6.19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil. Christ Jesus is our anchor within the veil. It is through him and him alone that we have access to God. Which is why if Paul said this in Ephesians 2.18. He says, for through him, speaking of Christ, for through him we, bo- we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 11 through 12. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access, confident access through faith in him. And now by faith in Christ... We who were once completely and totally separated from God, which again was all of us before salvation, we can now come before God in our prayers with boldness. With boldness. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. He says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. Did you catch that? Because Christ Jesus has entered through the veil. Because of his shed blood. Because of all that he's done for us. We can have confidence to enter into the holy place. We can have confidence and draw near to God with full assurance of faith. We can draw near. The very fact that we can pray to God and draw near to Him in prayer is a gift given to us by Christ Jesus and his shed blood. And guess what? Now, as believers, as those who have been united with Christ in both his death and his life, as those who are indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God, Because of what Christ has done for us to allow us access to the Father, we can have absolute full assurance that God hears our prayers. God hears our prayers. Psalms, Psalm 116, verses 1 and 2. I love the Lord. Because he hears my voice and because he hears my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined 
his ear to me. Therefore, I shall call upon him as long as I live. Psalms, Psalm chapter 18, verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry for help before him came into his ears. Psalm chapter 6, verse 8. Depart from me, all you, all you who do iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. Psalm 66, verses 19 through 20. But certainly God has heard. He has given heed to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who, ha who has not turned away my prayer, nor his loving kindness from me. Psalms 34, 17. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. First John chapter five, verses fourteen through fifteen. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Folks, have you ever just stopped to think about what an, ama what an amazing gift it is that God hears us? God hears our prayers. Again, before salvation, we were totally and completely separated from God in every way, shape, and form, even to the point that even our prayers, those that we just offered up flippantly as unbelievers, were not heard by God. He turned his face against us. But now, as believers, as those covered in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have been given this gift of prayer. We can enter into the very presence of God through prayer with boldness and confidence, having a full assurance and faith, knowing that God hears us. God hears our prayers, and that is a gift. Scripture tells us many things about our prayers. Many things about our prayers. Many applications for our prayers and how we pray to instruct us in prayer. One thing it tells us is that we must be making sure that when we pray, we pray according to God's will and not our own. The verse I just read, 1 John 5, 14 through 15, he says, this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
according to his will. And how do we know what the will of God is? Through God's word. See, these things are so interconnected, aren't we? Aren't they? You know, we went through the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit indwells us and points us to Christ through his word. We've talked about the word of God and how it, it shapes us and molds us more and more into the image of Christ. And now here, even in our prayers, our prayers should be focused and shaped by the word so that we're praying in accordance to God's will. And guess what? We can rest assured that when we are praying in accordance with God's will, not only can we be assured that God hears those prayers, but those prayers are effective and are powerful. Not only does God hear our prayers, but our prayers are effective. James chapter 5 is a beautiful passage just on the effectiveness of prayer. And James 5, and I'm going to read all of verses 13 through 18 because to me this is just so beautiful. He says in James 5, 13, Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? And I will just stop right there and and put in uh, Mike's thought on this. And and really the context is pretty clear. That when he says, is anyone among you sick there? He's not talking about physical sickness. He's talking about a spiritual sickness. As one who is weak and struggling in their faith. So he says, is anyone among you sick? then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And here it is. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months, and then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Our prayers are effective. God hears our prayers. And the effective prayers of a righteous man can accomplish much. Folks, this is something that I I can't fully explain or understand. Because God is absolutely sovereign over all things. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. He is sovereign over all. And he, and he providentially works over all things to see his will done. But in the midst of that, he so chooses to work through the prayers of the saints to see his will worked out in this world and in this life.
God is sovereign. Absolutely. But he works through the prayers of the saints. God is sovereign. But the prayers of a righteous man are effective. So when you come before the Lord in prayer, you can do so with confidence, knowing that God does hear our prayers and that he will use it to see his will done. We may not ever see how he uses it, or we may not ever see how he's answered your prayers, but you can rest assured that he will work through them to accomplish his will. So not only does God hear our prayers, not only are our prayers effective, but our prayers are a gift given to us by God in the midst of our trials to strengthen us, to build us up, to keep our thoughts focused on Christ and on God's word. Did you realize that prayer has been given to us to help us battle our temptations? To help us battle our trials? In Mark 14, verse 38, the context here is the Garden of Gethsemane. Guess what? Christ is about to be arrested. The apostles are about to be scattered. And what does Christ tell them? He says in Mark 14, 38, he says, Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Christ's message to the apostles at this moment was pretty clear. He says, you are about to face great temptation. So pray. Pray. Their Lord and Savior was about to be arrested. They were about to be scattered. Do you think there was a temptation there for them to become fearful? For them to become worried? For them to become discouraged? For them to, for them to get wrapped up in the midst of this huge trial? And become so, so overwhelmed that they're just broken by it? Oh yeah. That would have been a huge trial. Christ's instruction to them was to pray. To pray. How much more so for us when we face our trials. When we face temptation to be discouraged. Because temptation always starts, temptation to be discouraged always starts where? In our mind, right? Many of the trials and the temptations and the burdens we face start right here in our mind. How do we fight that? The same way Christ instructed the apostles to. Pray, 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 pray. Pray to God. Use God's word in your prayers. And it's amazing how just by the act of praying, your mind is oftentimes refocused off that temptation and back on God. Your mind is oftentimes refocused off of the discouragement and the battles. And it's back on what God has promised you. So when you feel discouragement coming, when you face a battle in your mind, pray, pray. But sometimes the battle isn't necessarily in our mind. Sometimes it is 
outside of us. Sometimes it is as we are in the world and around other people and the way they treat us. Because this world can be cruel. We can be treated badly sometimes, right? Sadly, even sometimes by fellow believers. Guess what? Christ gives us instruction for that as well. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 28. This is Christ speaking. He says, But I say to you, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. This is a teaching here that uh, can many times be hard to swallow, even for us believers. But Christ's message here is clear that if there is someone who hates you, someone who mistreats you, someone who curses you, Someone who is your enemy doesn't matter what they've done to you, doesn't matter how badly they've hurt you, your response should be to pray for them. To pray for them. He says, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. And folks, again, that prayer is absolutely vital as you are going through that trial of being mistreated. Because what does that prayer do? Well, through the act of prayer, again, Our thoughts and our mind are reshaped to see that person the way Christ sees them. And to love them the way Christ loves them. Regardless. Regardless of what they've done to us. I'm a firm believer that so many of the battles and the trials and the conflicts we face, even within the body, could be quickly resolved if we put the practice, the fact that anytime anyone even remotely does something that bothers us, before we do anything else, the first thing we do is we go to the Lord with it in prayer. And we pray and we pray and we pray and we say, Lord, please Help us to deal with this the way Christ would, to see them the way Christ would, to love them the way you do. And I think a lot of times the trials we face would become significantly smaller. So our prayer, 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 prayer is an amazing gift to help us Do you realize that even oftentimes after we have sinned, because as believers, like it or not, we're not perfect. We still sin. We still mess up from time to time. Even after we have sinned, and when we are broken by that sin, it is our prayers that God uses to heal us and to strengthen us. Psalm 32, verse 1 through 6. This is David speaking. He says, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And then he moves on to say, When I kept silent about my sin, my body 
wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with a fever heat of summer, Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you. And my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. And we don't have the time to unfold the beauty of this psalm, okay? This psalm is beautiful. But basically what David is saying here is that he had sinned. And for a period of time, instead of going to the Lord with that sin, he was broken by it. And it did hurt him. And the fact it hurt him so much that he said that when he kept silent about his sin, his body wasted away. He said he felt like he was groaning all day long because of that sin. He said his Vital, his vitality was drained away as with, as with the fever heat of summer. He said, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. The reality of that sin that he committed weighed on him. And finally, finally, he went to the Lord in prayer. He acknowledged his sin to the Lord. And he says, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. That's why at the start of the psalm he says, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And then at the end, he, fin he ended this by saying, surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. In other words, the believer who is anchored in prayer and has had the guilt of that sin removed, he's going to be upon a firm rock that no flood waters can overwhelm. So when you fall into sin, as all of us will, and you are truly broken by that sin, and you are repented of it, you need to pray. You need to be praying and confessing that to the Lord. So often, and many, many times when we sin, we feel unworthy to come before God in prayer, don't we? We do. We feel unworthy. But that gets us right back to where I started at. Was it our own worthiness that allowed us access to God in the first place? No. It is by the shed blood of Christ alone that we come before God. It is because of him and his righteousness that has been given to us that we can come before God even when we have sinned. So at those times when we have sinned, we need to be coming before God in prayer. We should quickly run to prayer and confess it to the Lord. And when we do that, the Lord will work through those prayers to heal us. And to build us back up. And to strengthen us.
prayer is an amazing gift. And guess what? As believers, sometimes there's times when we are just so broken, we're just so overwhelmed, we're just so burdened that we don't know what to pray, right? Have you ever been there? I think most of us as believers have. But you just can't come up with the words. You're so broken. It is, it is at times like that that God's love and grace and mercy upon us is so amazing that his spirit which is inside of us intercedes for us in prayer. Romans 8, 26 through 27. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the times when you are so broken that you just don't know what to pray, it is okay to just simply pray to God in silence. And the Spirit intercedes on our behalf according to the will of God. So again, I know I keep saying this over and over again, but prayer, folks, is an amazing gift. It is a gift given to us by God. Again, it is not for everyone. It is not for the world. Unbelievers flippantly pray to God all the time, but those go nowhere. Prayer is a specific gift given specifically to the saints. And it is given to us to build us up, to encourage us, to refocus us on Christ. It is given to us to help take our eyes off the trials and back on God where they should have been to begin with. How often should we be praying? Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. All the time. All the time. Doesn't mean we walk around with our eyes closed, right? But it does mean we should be in an attitude of prayer all the time, every moment we get. Sometimes it can even just be something as simple as just a thank you, Lord. Or sometimes just a Lord help me. But we should be praying all the time and not only should we be in a continual attitude of prayer, but we should make it a habit to gather together and pray. We should. First Timothy 2.8, he says, Therefore I want the men in every, every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Prayer should be a beautiful time of fellowship and gathering together to worship our God. And it's something we should do together. Because guess what? Not only does it strengthen us, but it helps also helps strengthen others. And as you are there with others praying, you are strengthened by their prayers. So 
So not only should we be praying without ceasing, we should be praying together, but we should also be constantly praying for one another, for the saints. Um, Ephesians 6.18 says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for the saints. Prayer is absolutely vital in our own, li- in our own lives, isn't it? Guess what? It's absolutely just as much vital in every other saint's lives. So not only should we be praying, but we should be praying for one another. And keep in mind that our prayers are heard by God. And that our prayers are effective. With our prayer, we pour out our hearts to God. And with prayer, we praise him. And we give him the glory he is due. With prayer, we show our love for God. And we show our love for the brethren. And remember, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Do you believe that? Amen. So, if prayer is powerful, and it is indeed is, let us be known as a people of prayer. We should be known as people of prayer. As people who are continuously going before our Heavenly Father. Prayer is a a gift given to us, so let us not neglect it. Let us not neglect it. Prayer is something I I feel like we far too often neglect and, and ignore. And then sometimes wonder why we are discouraged. Why we're going through trials. Why we're battling temptation. When you're going through those things, you got to stop and ask yourself, when was the last time I prayed? Have I prayed about this that I'm going through? Let us be praying. And let us now close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the gift of prayer. Lord, you have worked in such an amazing way to supply us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Lord. You have equipped us with everything we need for life and godliness in this world. So, Lord, just help us to be diligent to use what you've given us so that we might be strengthened and built up so that we might face the trials of this life and face them head on. Lord, um, Again, we just thank you for Christ Jesus and all that he's accomplished for us, Father. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.